There is nothing wrong with your radio. Do not attempt to adjust the volume. We are controlling the broadcast. For the next hour we will control all that you hear. You are about to experience the knowledge and insights of the Media Mothership. All right, welcome to Media Mothership, broadcasting out of Edge Radio Studios here in Nipaluna, Hobart, Tasmania. Uh, we're streaming, of course, on edgeradio.org.au as well as YouTube and Twitch for this program. And uh, you can find us by just searching Media Mothership. Uh, feel free to message us on the chat via 04888117. Uh, or you can send us a message on the chat at YouTube or Twitch. Uh, as always on Media Mothership, we explore how media can shape our understanding of the world around us, bizarre curiosities and things that it does. Uh, so sit back, enjoy, as we dive into today's topic, which is looking at video game adaptations. Adaptions transmedia storytelling that have gone well and bad. At the moment, there's, there's two really interesting stories circulating about that. So keep listening to Media Mothership here on Edge Radio 99.3 FM. Welcome back <laughs> to Media Mothership. Short break. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, two really interesting stories circulating at the moment around video game adaptations. Uh, the first one is what I mentioned on last week's show, which is how Dead by Daylight, the horror video game, has uh, really effectively created these uh, original characters that you fight against, as well as these uh, property characters. So Michael Myers from the Halloween movies, Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street, and so forth. So I want to look a little bit at that, as well as the uh, harsh critical uh, kind of uh, reaction to the Walking Dead series, which has received a huge amount of complaints as really failing to effectively do that movie justice. Uh, so Kotaku recently featured an article talking about how the new Waking, Walking Dead, sorry, the new Walking Dead game doesn't look very good uh, and probably not going to win any Game of the Year awards, the article goes on to say. So this is by Zach Zweizen, uh, who talks about uh, the video game that's based on the popular TV show and comic book series The Walking Dead. Uh, they've released a console version for it. Now, um, The Walking Dead has had a couple of spin-offs in video games. Uh, Telltale Games Walking Dead series has received a lot of positive critical reaction, saying that it really effectively takes those ideas. And in terms of adaptation or adapting that work for other mediums, what the Telltale Games version of Walking Dead did really well was that it's what's referred to as, uh, well, extending that story into another platform. What Henry Jenkins and others would say is transmedia. That is, it's going from its mothership media, which at this point was a comic book that then was adapted. So that's, you know, in terms of models that we're looking at, two dominant models we're looking at here. One is adaptation, where you're just adapting the work into a new medium. So in that sense, you're, uh, for Walking, the Walking Dead series, uh, it began life as a comic book, and then it was adapted into a TV show that was quite successful. And then there was a, um, a video game by Telltale Games. Welcome, Lord Taylor. Uh, a video game uh, by Telltale Games which uh, was transmedia, because what it did is it took the story from The Walking Dead and then did these what-ifs, you know. So uh, what if you looked at a different survivor uh, at the same time? Have you played The Walking Dead Telltale Games? Um, no. 
Sorry, I'll turn your mic on. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, there we go. You know, your opinion does matter. <laughs> Wasn't silencing it by turning your mic off. These are the like the sto- the story driven ones, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. More um, kind of classic RPG story wheel pops up. You got a couple of choices. Ah, uh, no, no, no. no. Yeah. But I have played a Walking Dead game in VR. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. Okay. So what we're doing in today's show is we're looking at two stories that are looking at adaptation, mm-hmm. adapting work. Which I refer to as, yeah, would you use the word adaptation? I this would. is an interesting adaptation. Yes. Yeah. For some reason, I was getting confused around adapting and adaptation. Thinking, <laughs> oh, you know, uh, am I talking about the same thing? I am. Yeah. That's why I'm so used to <laughs> having someone else on the show. Uh, so the VR game, is it an adaption? So does it just retell the story like the video game, the comic book or the TV show? Or is it transmedia, which uh, fills in... Some new content. I'm fairly sure it's it's a transmedia one. I haven't watched all the way Walking Dead, but I think it's yeah, it's a um, a different story completely. It was so scary, I got so freaked out during it that I um, returned it. <laughs> oh, right. So you got it from like the Steam store, and you could return it if you've only played X number of minutes. Ah, uh, no. The uh, what's it called? The Meta Store. Oh, really? They have a similar refund policy mm-hmm. that if you've... Wow. Okay. So that's really interesting because one of the things... There's another key term, uh, if I bring up my lecture notes. Today's a lecture. <laughs> Just turning it into a lecture. Um, one of the interesting things about... Ah, yes. One of the interesting other terms I wanted to mention was... Uh, I think I've written it down. Uh, poly, polysemic storytelling, the idea that then there's two different concepts within the, um, the story, one of which is oh, maybe I uh, kind of intertextual. And, yeah, so intercompositional transmedia and intracompositional oh, right. okay, yeah. transmedia. Uh, I've got the following example <laughs> what we're looking at. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So cause what we're looking at here is, um, all right, so polymorphic fiction. <laughs> I'm just going to throw key words out. I'm not going to barely define them. Dana, 2010, uses this term polymorphic fiction to talk about where a uh, when you adapt a work or turn something into transmedia and you're mainly paying attention to what that platform does really well so that you can lean into that platform to create the story, right? right so, yeah. you know, you, you want to tell a story, but you don't have any budget, so you create it as a comic book because you know you can do a science fiction alien invasion thing with zero budget because you can draw really well. Mm-hmm. So there you're leaning into the properties of a comic book which serves that really well, which is that you don't need to make models, you don't need to do CG, you don't need to spend all this money. You can just write it as a comic book. Then maybe that becomes very successful. And then with that money, you can then lean into another platform like uh, uh, you know, a, a, an animation again, right? Or in this case, what I'm interested in in terms of leveraging the strengths of the platform is VR, right? Yeah. So we have a horror story, Walking Dead, which is basically a zombie outbreak occurs and you're with a group of survivors and um you know it's the classic zombies the 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 mainly shufflers slow moving (laughs) zombies right uh uh, but what's really interesting is yes setting it in vr and taking advantage of those which is what was it about translating the walking dead series into vr that worked so well for you i mean in terms of like it was so scary you returned it that you couldn't play it which is counter yeah yeah which is kind of productive to what they want really (laughs) Um, yeah, it's just the fact of that it's so, um, well, VR is one of the most immersive sort of medias that you can have, because uh, there's things all around you, and when your attention is one direction, there's still stuff going on behind you. So is it the sound well? that mm-hmm. was getting to you? What was really getting to you within that VR space? Was it... <laughs> 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 That's perfect. That sound effect is the, the, the kind of walkers... Yeah. Sound effects. I wonder if I can... Uh, anyway, you did it so well, I didn't even need to bring up a YouTube of it. <laughs> right, so, you know, the soundscape. And again, mm-hmm. VR immerses you. So you've got the headset on, and within that you're kind of uh, uh, seeing visuals as you will from your periphery. And then it was that sound that was 
escalating the, the heart rate. And so but it's also this thing of as well, which I've found with a lot of sort of um, role-playing VR games, and that is when things come at you. So I think for a lot of people, if, if it's like realistic enough, it might trigger, you know, fight or flight responses in people to have something that's like large yeah, coming yeah, at you and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Like even when I'm playing Skyrim VR and there's a wolf that's running at you, it's uh, still, you still sort of go, oh God, oh. And then just and look, swing at it. You know, that, that's, it's, it's, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, this phenomenon reminds me of those stories of the first silent films that were shown in uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, expos where people uh, allegedly, the, the one of those those films that were, they would show in these expositions or expos would be uh, a train coming towards mm, the yeah, camera, yeah. which people reacted to as physically running away from in terms of thinking, oh, my God, it's a real train or something. So similar, yeah. I mean, it, it, it. And then, of course, the uh, the goodies um, played on that, and they had a uh, uh, a film clip of a car coming towards the camera. That's right, and then it does. <laughs> and then it does. It bursts <laughs> through the screen. <laughs> All right. So what I want to play for you now. So uh, this is there's a new Walking Dead game that's come out, and it's getting trashed online. Right. Like uh, there's an article in Kotaku talking about how it's really failing. Uh, mainly because it's it's an adaptation, right? So it's taking the first season, uh, from what I can understand. And the scene we're going to have a look at is it's... Have you seen The Walking Dead TV show? I have. Well, at okay. least the first season. Yeah. Really. So it's the, the big scene. I think it's in the first season where you have uh, Shane and Rick facing off against each other. <laughs> right. Where And again, spoiler, but it's been a long time. Rick kills Shane, right, in this scene because... Um, uh, Shane, uh, from what I remember, what he wants to take over the group. Yeah. And basically, he's competing with Rick and his. With Brick. <laughs> with Brick and Rick. Uh, you know, all this drama behind the scenes where. Um, he took his wife and things, yep. et cetera. So it's really dramatic, great storytelling. Now, that scene happens in the video game. But the thing about the video game is that they do it as a boss fight. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what happens is there's a cutscene. I'll play a bit of the cutscene <laughs> where the two voice actors kind of uh, read some of that dialogue from the TV show. And then, then basically it's a boss fight with like GTA, right? <laughs> You've got guns and you, a shotgun and you, you're shooting each other. Constantly, right? You've got a lot. You've got a big health meter, <laughs> and you've got phrases you can use. So we're going to listen to that. <laughs> okay. I, you, you won't unfortunately see the visuals, but uh, you know you can tell me if it makes sense with okay, audio. Only. Sure. So here we go, and you can decide if you've seen The Walking Dead if this makes sense to you. Mm-hmm. What is, is what you're hearing making you think? Oh yeah, yeah, this is taking advantage of a video game and seems to be translating this into a really effective experience. All right, so here we go. So this is where you plan to do it? As good a place as any. It ain't going to be easy, but Lori will get over you. They done it before. They just gonna have to. You gonna kill me in cold blood? Take my place so you can screw my wife? Have my children? My children! Call you daddy? Is that what you want? I'm a better father than you, Rick! I'm better for Lori than you, man, because I'm a better man than you, Rick! Because I'd fight for her! Raise your gun. I won't. You're gonna have to shoot an unarmed man. Now listen to me, Shane. There is still a way back from this. Nothing has happened here. We're gonna lay down our guns. We're gonna walk back to the farm. Together. Back to Lori. Put this all behind us. Bullshit. This only ends one way. Only one of us is going back to that farm. All right, that's the cutscene. So now we're gonna play the actual (laughs) GTA shootout boss fight you do. How did that go, though? Do you, do you think that kind of... I mean, it's a pretty long cut scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, was, it, was it work? Did it work so far? You're well, thinking, okay, that's building yeah, up like it was. At the moment, I want to lay down my gun. <laughs> I want to lay down. I'm going to lay down my gun. <laughs> and we're going to go back to the farm. Yeah, so it seems... Yeah, you know, it's good. It's basically a straight adaptation. Mm-hmm, yeah. And this is where it kind of goes weird for people. Uh, and we'll try to see how the power of audio conveys it. <laughs> 
Because basically it takes a, a really dramatic scene in the TV show where I can't even... How does he shoot him? Like, it, he just... How does that... I can't it's remember. It's really dramatic and it's really a lot of pathos because mm. Rick's killing his best friend yeah. from the police force and... Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't play out as a shooting spree <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as the game does. Anyway, let, let's listen to it. All right, so you've got to decide here if Rick should lead or if Shane should lead. You're playing as Shane, Way. so you've selected Shane should lead. Sorry, brother. All right, so a bit more of a cut scene here. We haven't yet got into the, the fight. We've just seen some cuts. We were doing just fine without you. Then you come back and just destroy everything. All right, and here we go. Here's the game. Look at that, that music. Basically, imagine GTA. So it's third person view. You're out of your mind, Shane. And you're picking up ammo <laughs> around these hay bales. You got a shotgun and you're shooting Rick's face. <laughs> Continually. Rick's just taking it. That was three shots to Rick's head. It's fine. So as you can see, Rick's, I mean, Rick's pretty strong. <laughs> There's a health meter. Rick's at half health now. <laughs> but you've picked up a crowbar. Rick pushes you back. You've got your crowbar. <laughs> Taking two shots, three shots, <laughs> four shots. <laughs> Rick. But that music is keeping you going. Keep your adrenaline going. Don't let him get you. Sharp shoulders, so there's good dialogue. <laughs> this for a long time. Be this way. Be this way, so you think you can take my family? That was four more. My I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry, Rick. These are all hitting me. <laughs> You're weak, Rick. Not really. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty strong. Rick's at like. Shame. 10% health. <laughs> oh, you got him. So now you got him? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, oh, Rick. It has to be this way. Oh, you made me do this. There's a cutscene. And you go to bus fight level two now. <laughs> Rick's back, full health. Please, Rick. If you're okay, so wake now, up, I need you to do it now. Rick's go back, got full Rick. health again. Can't go back. And you've only got crowbars. <laughs> now, so it's all yeah. melee. Yeah. Wait for me. Me. And then there's these... Ah, you pricks! There's Look zombies that are trying to attack you. Look at yourself! Look at yourself, with what you've become. So it's, it's Got a, it. You've always been I'm there. not done just yet. This, this is what a man it's does, Rick! It's radio escape. Mm. Rick. Get off of me! Because it is a fight that you're doing, like GTA level fight. Help but you've got this now. audio... Yeah. Go back. <laughs> Okay, and then we're going into boss fight three. <laughs> right? You, this, this was you, the not scene, me. And you kill Rick. <laughs> All right, so there we go. There wow. we go. How did that stand up in audio? To you? did you think, kind of think this got some of that Walking Dead scene quite right and some of it not quite right? No, it didn't get it right. Because yeah, a, 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 yeah. a big part about The Walking Dead, well, especially season one, was how good the music and the soundscape was. And there was only one sort of good aspect that I thought of that in, in that, and that was during the first cutscene, and it had the, um, uh, what's it called, the strings going... That's one of my favourite sort of sound effects, is um, right. the creepy strings. Um, and then when the actual music started, it didn't fit what... I assumed no. to be happening on screen. Yeah, it was that. It was that kind of typical uh, shooter boss game kind of adrenaline, you know, suspense music. On a loop forever, and you just kind of keep. And you're thinking, why is my heartbeat going so so, so much? And it's because of that damn loop. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty cliched mm -hmm. and. You know, again, given the huge fan base that the first season, certainly, and the second season, 
has for Walking Dead, it, it, many people are kind of complaining that, they, what, what's going on? Why are we getting this game? Why is it so bad? How is it unable to translate the source material so well? Because for a long time, yeah, video games would constantly be criticized for not being, not, not being good at adaptations at all yeah. of, of the source material. Um, you know, I guess the classics... So I wrote down a list of some of the classic uh, kind of games that are considered to be bad, right? The, the, the big one being in 1982, the E.T. extraterrestrial game, which came out. And, you know, so the story goes, led to the collapse of the uh, American and Western console gaming market for 10 years until Japan came with Nintendo. Uh, and, and E.T. was bad, right? I mean, it's... it's uh, For 1982... Um, I mean, many people point to the problem with E.T. was it occurred with a short development cycle, right? So they needed to rush it through for the Christmas market. It wasn't really effectively playtested. It wasn't a, a good game in terms of the challenges. E.T. would fall in this hole and it would take you forever <laughs> to get out of the hole. And so it was this kind of shovelware vibe where it was just pushed out. But because, of course, E.T., uh, there, it was a Spielberg movie and there was a lot of promotion behind it, um, uh, yeah, many retailers overinvested in stock, and mm-hmm. when it bombed, and when people returned it after Christmas, or where word of mouth kind of really trashed it, uh, retailers were left with all these unsold copies, and they had so many unsold copies. But it wasn't just ET; the same thing was happening across so many different games publishers at this point, where mm-hmm. they were just pushing out overpriced, undercooked, underdeveloped products, mm. and yeah, it led to an oversaturated market that was charging way too much. And it fell over and led to one of my favorite documentaries, which was the E.T. Um, archival dig in like the Arizona desert. Which you read this where there was this, yeah. yeah, the legend, the urban legend, well, true legend that. Uh, you can dig down in a dump yeah. far enough until you reach E.T. <laughs> yeah, because retailers, uh, well, they'd, uh, they'd all been returned to Atari. And so Atari was sitting on this mountain of un uh, or returned ET games that no one wanted, and they allegedly dumped them all in this one big landfill in, in I think it's Arizona or Texas or somewhere. And so uh, maybe ten years ago they went back in there and they did this archival dig. There's YouTube. There's a little documentary about it. What's great about it is they're digging through the land tip and they're talking about getting closer because like they've got a Barbie head. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, this is like a 85 vintage Barbie head. We're getting close. And it's just like as they talk about dinosaur <laughs> remains. All right, we're hitting the Jurassic Strata now. Of, <laughs> and they, they did, yeah, they did find some, some, some cartridges uh, of E.T. So, yeah, it's... But again, it's yeah considered one of these classic bombs of of video games. Uh, but I want to change tack and and play a little bit from. Um, <laughs> actually, before we do, what I want to do is, is is play a little clip from what I consider one of my favorite video game adaptations, which is the Scarface video game, the PlayStation Two, uh, twelve years ago, <laughs> and and I like it. Because have you watched Scarface, the Al Pacino movie, right? It ends uh, unproblematically as, as the end, right? The main character, Tony Montana, dies, is killed. And basically, it's, it's, a, it's a cautionary tale, right? It's, it's, uh, Tony Montana plays this um, uh, rags-to-riches story uh, as he goes up the uh, Miami uh, crime scene. And, yeah, he's a violent, horrible guy basically. And he's killed at the end in this apex of cocaine. And he says that classic line, say hello to my little friend, as he shoots his like grenade launch machine gun. So yeah, it's a classic game, but uh, a classic movie, but considered to be, you know, unproblematically cautionary as to how power corrupts. Video game, however, rewrites it and says, you know, we're, we're doing the video game from just before Tony Montana dies. Uh, but you survive. And he doesn't actually die. <laughs> yeah, you survive. You kill everyone and you go on in your uh, drug kingpin mm-hmm. way. So uh, there's an interview here with the uh, director. And I want to play a little bit of it as he talks about the challenges of making adaptation games and why he thinks Scarface works. And it'll be interesting to hear your views as to whether or not you think his theory okay. on how his narrative works. It's interesting because this game, uh, this, this company's also done. Uh, another PlayStation 2 game, which is considered to be a great remake, called The Thing, 
based on John Carpenter's The Thing, uh, which has this kind of traitor mechanic in it, this kind of suspense traitor mechanic, which works quite well. Anyway, here we go. This is an interview from uh, IGN 12 years ago. The, We've done a, a lot of movie-based Scarface. games, and prior to doing Scarface, The World Is Yours, we, you know, we did The Thing and Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay. Uh, and I think every time you're starting off with a movie-based game, you know, you sort of start out with one arm tied behind your back because there's just a perception that movie-based games suck. And, you know, look, I mean, the reason why I like working on movie-based games and that's pretty much all we've done in the last six years uh, is because you know, it's a challenge to us that we view you know, adapting games from other mediums as a challenge and a fun challenge. And we're really lucky to work with Universal who, you know, whether it's a thing or really um, There's gunfire <laughs> in the background. It's not that he's doing the interview in a walk scene. It's just that for wonderful reasons, IGN's decided to play video clips from the game in the background and not mute the volume. <laughs> so, so frustratingly, it gets in the way of actually hearing what yeah. he says. Well, we'll push on. But yes, you'll, you'll hear a lot of gunfire and explosions. <laughs> That's simply, you know, and again, Scarface, if you've not played it, basically it's a, it's a Grand Theft Auto clone. So think of San Andreas level graphics. Uh, and it's basically the same. You know, you, you're, you're, you're stealing cars, you're killing people, uh, you got a health meter and so forth, third person. Anyway, uh, going back to the game designer for Scarface. Or Scarface will always allow us to take risks and chances to create better games. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the important things for us when doing Scarface as an open world game is that not only do we have all the locations, you know, if there's a location from the film, it's in the game, uh, whether it be, you know, the mansion or you know, the Coconut Grove uh, outdoor bar area or the Babylon Club or the Sun Ray Motel or Sosa's Mansion. And that list goes on and on and on. Um, not only do you get to go and see those places, but you understand the relationship, the distance between one another. Uh, and so and that, that's quite an interesting point, because I know people talked about uh, one of the Simpsons games, the hit and run game, oh, yeah. something like that. They said it's the only video game or it's the only text which actually mapped out the location of all the spots in the Simpsons universe. It was one of the first times that you had the map mm -hmm. of where everything was in the Simpsons via this game. So it's interesting he's making the point of talking about how important locations are, getting to locations, yeah. going to those, being able to search around them. And it is quite fun. Um, you know, there's this, I'm trying to remember some games I've played where, where you just go to, you know, get to go into that location where, where the, you know, the movie was set and your character in mm. it. By seeing all of those location-based stuff and then adding all of these characters that are also from the film or referenced from the film, we're allowed to create a new, uh, different extension of that Scarface universe. So, yeah, extension, to key term there. Uh, so what we've got is the locations, key locations, key characters, but it's set immediately after the movie, mm -hmm. so you get to extend that story. And the, the trick is... Whether or not they're doing it effectively, right? So as opposed to, I guess, the Walking Dead one, where all they did, like, and, and I guess talking about how video games can be a great medium, in the Walking Dead example, it failed because it turned that scene into a boss fight, mm -hmm. which was unrealistic and repetitive, and the music scoring was unoriginal. So it it used video game, important video game, qualities you know the boss fight yeah. is a classic you know a two-person fighter street fighter kind of mechanic and and you know so many video games have that boss fight moment but it <laughs> it turned a scene which isn't really a boss fight to begin with yeah it is a boss fight on one level i mean you literally have someone trying to be the boss of 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 that community uh shane and then rick has to kill him uh, but Rick isn't really killing another boss. It's it's an act of pathos and yeah. tragedy and sadness. And yeah, in the in the game, it doesn't quite work that because you're 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 using twenty shotgun shells to keep <laughs> killing this OP. Anyway, let's listen to what they say about Scarface. You know, Tony says, "All I have in this world are my balls and my word. I don't break them for nobody." Uh, and so we took that idea of you know intestinal fortitude, and the more you know strategic you are in terms of how you shoot and use combat, the more balls you get. When your balls meter is full, you're allowed to go into blind rage. And we'll 
I love so okay. So he uses a, a quote from the film. He says, "All I've got in the world is my balls and my honor." I think is what it was. And so the game designers then say, "Okay, so we we focused in on the idea of intestinal fortitude, e.g., balls." And you get points in the game. So as you kill people, you have this meter on your on the display called your balls meter, which you get increasing uh, amounts of. And as you raise that balls percentage, so you, you've just killed someone, that's plus 66 balls it pops up on the screen. And so you, your balls meter <laughs> goes up 66. And once you get it to the max, you can then go into blind rage mode, which kind of replicates in the movie. You know, there are scenes where Tony gets completely coked out of his head and just starts killing people, takes some shots, but is impervious to those shots because of the drugs. Here they translate that movie narrative into a video game kind of skill meter or resource meter that then you can use which kind of cute i think <laughs> anyway okay let's keep listening to how he talks about the balls meter the more balls you get when your balls meter is full you're allowed to go into blind rage and what we do in blind rage is it's it was it, it came from that idea of tony's on the top of the the balcony at the last scene he's all coked up he's fucking pissed off he's shooting everybody um, that blind rage of just sheer, and like he's unstoppable. He's getting hit by bullets and nothing stops him. And we wanted to put that into the game as a major gameplay element, not just as a little niche thing, but as a major component. So when the player finally builds his balls up, goes into blind rage, several things happen. One, we jump into first person. That's a drastic change for most open world games. Um, in addition to that, we make the player completely invulnerable. We give him unlimited ammunition with whatever gun he's holding at the time. And then we allow the player to shoot people and gain health for each person they kill. I think one of the things that when you're looking at this big open world, it's got... Um, I like the effort they're making. <laughs> you know, points for effort in terms of the most memorable part of that movie for many people is that, that scene that he describes there. The scene on the balcony where he's facing insurmountable melt odds. And he's just snorted this huge mountain of cocaine, and then he bursts out of his uh, kind of headquarter room and, to, and and starts shooting people. So they've taken that idea, they've turned it into a mechanic of, you know, as you kill people, you get your balls meter up, you, you trigger this kind of state of mind that Tony's in at the end, where you're, you've got unlimited ammo, un, unlimited health, I think, first person view. And you get health points. Oh, no, you're not unlimited health. You get health points back from killing people. You know, I, th there's something distasteful about it, <laughs> you know? And I think more than distasteful, there's something which is directly contradictory of the source text, which is that it's a cautionary tale where we're not actually wanting to set... And he's, an, he's not even anti anti-hero. He's, he's a villain, Yeah. right? Tony Soprano... Sorry, not Tony Soprano. <laughs> Scarface... <laughs> Tony Scarface is is a is a villain, yeah. right? He's um, a deeply deeply flawed person uh, who's uh, uh, hubris and greed <clears throat> and um, paranoia uh, are his downfall at the end. Which is funny because um, if you uh, place that against the blacklist, where you've got the main character of that who is a villain, but also portrayed as the good guy. Yeah. Even though like, there's no cautionary tale. Even though everything that he does is incredibly violent, incredibly horrible, and facilitates drugs and all of this stuff and killings and stuff like that. And yet there's no cautionary tale there. I, I, th I think it can be difficult for people to unpack w w what a, what a main character is when they're not a good person. Mm. Or not even a main character. Uh, a, a, well, I guess you've got your kind of Walter White character uh, who... But I, Walter I, White, well, I, haven't, I haven't seen it, but I, from what I've, <laughs> what I've read about it, he always has good intentions or, or there's some sort of intention initially, behind it. Initially, yeah. his, his initial reason for becoming, a, again, a drug lord is because he is, um, you know, he's made poor choices, I would say, uh, in life and has found himself in a dead-end job as a teacher and uh, you know, poorly remunerated 
and struggling to take care of his family mm -hmm. and he gets a cancer diagnosis which it seems to be terminal and about to uh, expire his life and so then he decides he needs money quickly for his family to survive so you know yeah good good cause for the wrong reasons kind mm -hmm. of thing or whatever it is you know it, so yeah but then then he quickly descends into a um chaotic evil <laughs> kind of character where he he's given opportunities of redemption or given opportunities to make the right choice and doesn't and right okay, care yeah. and disaster to occur and becomes villainous so not even an anti-hero which i think is the there was an article two through weeks back about how uh some fans of the boys superhero series again comic book series made into a prime tv show which lampoons and parodies and uh satires satirizes the um <clears throat> superhero narrative where you've got a superman character completely op'd superhero character who basically is a right-wing <laughs> fascist <laughs> uh immature uh, you know, uh, overly hu hubristic person, right? Who who has no self control, and you're not meant to like them. There's nothing heroic about them, but their trappings, the way the way the satire of it is, is that they're presented through the media as as Captain America. Yeah, yeah. But people are missing that satire and and seeing him uh, claiming that this character is an anti-hero. They're saying, no, 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 he's he's a, he's an anti-hero. Right, wanting to still shroud him as a heroic character, mm. but saying, "Oh no, 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 no!" The antihero, of course, is 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 doing things that that are challenging the normal order. And yes, while while their means are wrong, their ends are justified. Right, their means are bad. Like the Punisher character, for instance, has his means are violent. Right, they will, they will be involved the death of people, but the, the idea that they justify the ends. Right, they're the bad people that he's killing. Yeah, yeah. So they're trying to say the same thing, but no, 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 the, the, the Homelander character, uh, his ends are not heroic <laughs> to begin with. He's not trying to do anything good. He's purely serving his own ego. Mm. He is an un, you know, unproblematic you know, fascist type character. And they're, they're, not, they're mystifying what the anti-hero is. Mm -hmm. So similar here. I mean, Tony from Scarface is not an anti-hero because he's – the ends that he's doing are not at all in any way positive, right? Building up a drug empire, mm -hmm. becoming rich and successful. Those might be desirable ends. But when it comes to pro being a protagonist, yeah. he's still the protagonist of the story. Oh, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. because the antagonists here are the uh, other gri crime bosses. And crime. Crime bosses, <laughs> crime bosses, as well as the antagonists being the police force, right? They are stopping our main character, mm -hmm. the protagonist, Tony yeah. from Scarface, uh, getting what he wants, which is to be a drug lord. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, and again, you know, uh, your, your main character doesn't need to be a positive character. And this, it, it, Scarface is a great example of mm -hmm. that. The main character is is not a hero. He's a villain. Mm. Um, um, he's a very, very memorable villain. He's not an anti-hero, though. There's nothing at all heroic about him. So it is awkward talking about the video game version of it which then further takes the logic of that <laughs> yeah further and says you know well no you're playing as tony soprano uh, tony it's really Sprite, again tony scarface <laughs> they're the same genre tony montana tony montana that's it yeah. uh and, and you're killing people but you're getting kind of these rewards for it but again, you know, I I take it back to that point I said last week about the taxi driving kid that was playing GTR. That there's GTR. this <laughs> GTR GTA. There's the game mechanics. Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> It'll be Grand Theft. Uh, what's an R thing that you can steal? Grand Theft uh, Recorder. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know the the uh, the point about the taxi mission is that the kid was playing it violently, killing or uh, you know injuring pedestrians. So but he, says. he was doing it in a way to min max finishing the mission. So he says. So in this game, you can fall in love with the mechanics, right? The balls meter, the first person shoot of you, uh, and you vicariously, I suppose, enjoy the wish fulfillment fantasy of the death and destruction that you're unleashing. They're saying a lot about you, Craig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm thinking a whole. Uh, <laughs> what about 455? Um, 
yeah, maybe maybe I should leave myself in the hole. We're five minutes to okay, the sure. hour. Yeah. 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 Well, I haven't yet got around. So this will be part one <laughs> <laughs> of my analysis of video game adaptions. Next week, we'll be looking at the thing I wanted to look at two weeks ago <laughs> and today, which was the Dead by Daylight series yeah, yeah. and their approach to it. Okay, so homework for next week show will be uh, reading Henry Jenkins 2011 Transmedia Theory. <laughs> Come on. Right? So you can you can read his book Spreadable Media. Um, this is really good. Uh, I'll put show notes <laughs> with the reading list on the YouTube page. Uh, two other quick stories. Okay. Okay, before I bump into K-pop Ooh. Unlimited. Yeah. Uh, first one is Ardman Animations is running out of its iconic clo- clay. Clothes. <laughs> Clothes, jeez. Uh, <laughs> you, you, yeah, you sent me the um, show notes. Yep. And, yeah, this is horrific news. Yeah, so uh, uh, what's happened is that there's a very, very specific special type of clay that Ardman Animations use. Ardman Animations famous for Wallace and Gromit, of course, as well as many, many other films from Ardman Animations. Pirates Band of Misfits, that's one of their yeah. best. Uh, uh, Shaun the Sheep, did they do that? Yeah, they did Shaun the Sheep. Shaun the Sheep, but that's yep. was good. Okay, and they have this uh, particular clay... Um, that they've been using uh, called New Plast. And it's from only one manufacturer in Torquay. Torquay. Torquay, <laughs> which is a town outside the county of Devon in <laughs> England. Uh, and it's closing down, right? And they've said they've not been able to find anyone to, to buy. And uh, Ardman Animation talk about how this clay is really, really special because of its plasticity and it's very easy to mold and maintain shape. But they've bought up tons of it, but they're saying once it's gone, it's gone. Mm. And Ardman Animations will be unable to create the same types of practices and creating models. What do you reckon? What's it's horrific horrific. news. Yeah. Why didn't they buy the company? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, that's a point. Yeah. Hey, a lot of comments are pointing this out. Hey, the, like, the guy was trying to find someone to buy the clay company this one and only one in England, and they couldn't find anyone to buy it. So they're closing down. Ardman Animation seems bought a ton of their clay, but because mm. uh, in the article it talks about how they one idea might be they'll, they'll go into manufacture of clay themselves. Mm. Uh, Do, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, does anybody else use New Plast? Yeah, because there are, there are other claymation. So is it creators. just for claymation? Um, is there no other use for it? schools use it in their clay class <laughs> imagine i mean where else do you encounter that, clay that is well clay teaching is a teaching tool for primary school it's clutching at straws um, don't you think yeah well then well they might just use play-doh like everybody else yeah well, well see that would be the competitor right and obviously i animations would have opinions on why Play-Doh does not work. Well, Play-Doh always goes, like, in gritty, doesn't it? You can it? get the other... There's the other type of clay, you know, that kind of white clay you can get that um, isn't Play-Doh, that's <laughs> higher quality. Yeah, yeah. I think it's from Italy or something. <laughs> it's hard-hitting news here. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so Admin Animation. So if you're a fan of Admin Animation... Which I am. Uh, keep your eye on this, because, yeah, it might impact their ability to create future mm. product. Uh, last story is Spider-Man 2 plays a roasting MJ's trash podcast setup. That, that was just like a, a group of, a of words to which of I couldn't story. understand. What, yeah. what does that mean? I don't know. With one minute left of the show, I don't think I can do it. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it as a cliffhanger. Thanks for listening to Edge Radio. Uh, well, no, no, just my show. Keep listening to Edge Radio. This has been Media Mothership for another week with Dr. Craig. Joined by Lord Taylor. Hello, Lord Taylor. We didn't do Hello. an intro, so Hello. we're doing an Hello. outro. Uh, any, any, any last words? Anything you've learned? What's happening in K-pop? Um, my computer monitor destroyed itself, so I've got no way to access to my, my computer. So I've just got songs that I've played over the past twelve weeks, and I've got a selection. Wow. So it's the the hits. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. So uh, coming up next is K-Pop Unlimited with Lord Taylor. No, DJ TJ and DJ CJ. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, keep listening next week on Media Mothership. We'll be looking at... Uh, Dead by Daylight. Dead by Daylight uh, uh, and uh, page 
57 of Henry Jenkins' 2011 book, Spread on Weed. Oh, and an interesting thing that I'd want to put in, in your show next week as well is to do with the prevalence of AI-generated imagery across um, uh, music videos, pop music videos. Oh, okay. Yeah. I will do my homework. Good. <laughs> in 2023, Edge Radio turns 20. Join the party, edgeradio.org.au.